I wanted to start this week's session with a brief overview of the history of program evaluation. I think it's important to understand where evaluation started and how it has evolved into what program evaluation is today. Then I want us to focus our attention on the differences between social problems and social conditions, which will be essential for you to understand the difference when we begin our discussions and work on evaluating programs. And lastly, I have a series of YouTube videos for you to view that is a great introduction into how and why we do program evaluations. Now the videos are geared toward program evaluation in a business setting and not a social service setting. However, the principles are the same and the videos are fantastic in explaining the workings of program evaluation. Okay, let's get started with the brief history on program evaluation. The history of evaluation varies based on who is writing the history, but in particular, authors from different disciplines tend to credit slightly different people and events as leading to modern evaluation. For example, Ralph Taylor, who began his writing in the, the late 1930s, is sometimes credited with being a founding father of evaluation, but he was in the field of education. Tyler used an objectives-oriented approach, which involves stating behavioral objectives, measuring the objectives, and then uh, determining whether the objectives have been attained or not. Now, I would like to trace the modern phase of program evaluation back to the 1960s. This was the time of President Johnson's War on Poverty, you know, the Great Society era, and a corresponding increase in social programs to help improve a host of social problems. The first book on evaluation during this period was published in 1967 by Edward Suchman, and this book was entitled Evaluation Research. But even more important than Suchman's book was Campbell and Stanley's book uh, titled Experimental and Quasi-Experimental Designs for Research. And this focused on conducting scientific research outside of the laboratory to determine which programs worked and which did not work. The late Donald Campbell, one of the giants in research methodologies in many ways, considered himself to be an evaluation methodologist and he actively wrote in the era of program evaluation. By the way, one of the things that was well learned during the 1960s and 1970s was that social programs are quite difficult to improve and that it's naive to expect that any single program will have a large impact. And that's for two reasons. First, because there are so many other factors operating in people's lives like their health, their motivation, the so support systems that they have. And second, because of larger structural factors like social stratification, economic cycles, their culture, education, and so on. If we find programs that at least help relative to other programs and approaches, then we're usually happy today with that program and allow it to continue. During the 1970s, a host of evaluation books were written, professional evaluation journals were created, and professional evaluation associations were formed. It was clear by the 1970s that evaluation was here to stay, and there are hundreds of professionals who now call themselves evaluators. As we progressed and learned more about programs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that is what works and what doesn't work in evaluation and how one program by itself could not possibly fix a social problem or the underlying social conditions, evaluators turned their attention to more of an attitude of using evaluation to improve existing programs rather than a punitive attitude of axing the program that was unable to completely fix the social problem. So today we work from the standpoint of doing program evaluation to find out what works, what doesn't work so well, and what we can do to change or improve the program so it does work better. So today, evaluation is a relatively fr a thriving profession and is composed of professionals and scholars from multiple disciplines and working in a variety of international, national, state, and local settings. The prof Professional Association for Program Evaluators is known as the American Evaluation Association. 
I've included a link to this organization in your learning materials for this week, so please be sure to go to this website and check it out. If you are seriously considering a career in program evaluation, I would strongly urge you to seriously consider joining this association as a student member. The fees are relatively small for students, and it would be a fantastic resource for you as they have lots of learning materials and annual conferences for continued learning. Okay, now with a little bit of history under our belts and the understanding that program evaluation is about what's working, what's not working, and how we can improve the program so it can work better, I want to take a minute to talk about social problems and social conditions. It is important to make this distinction now because when you are evaluating social programs, it is imperative that you understand whether the program is addressing a social problem or a social condition. So let's talk about the differences here. We'll start with the social problem. What is a social problem? We can think of a problem or a social problem as a, a certain condition that people and or the public define as problematic. Here are some examples of social problems. Homicide, uh, DWI traffic deaths, and smoking in public places. Now, this last one in particular, the smoking in public places, has become, most recently in American society, considered a social problem because of the health, health risk to all and not just to the smoker. Now, I bring up the smoking in public places because until recently, this was not a problem for most people. As a matter of fact, smoking used to be looked upon as normal and expected, and everyone smoked in their offices, in restaurants, and believe it or not, even in the college classroom. So you can see from this example that claims about social problems must be supported by citizen consensus that existing social arrangements are inadequate. It is the socially constructed definitions of citizens that define social problems and frames their interpretation. Aid to farmers, for example, is called parity. Aid to corporations is called economic incentives. And aid to poor persons is called welfare, or some people refer to them as handouts. So this is why consensus about what constitutes a social problem sometimes can be difficult to achieve among those persons wishing uh, to do so. So for example, it would be difficult to argue that consensus exists in America about whether gun control or abortion constitutes social problems. We have huge debates over those areas and we don't ever come to a consensus on what is the social problem or if it is a social problem. But as with smoking in public places, this too may change one day based on citizen consensus. Now that we have a little bit better understanding of social problems, let's look at social conditions. Here you can see that I've listed the social problem as teen pregnancy. Now for one reason or another, American citizens have decided that teen pregnancy is a social problem. Some of these reasons might be that teens should not be parents because they're still children, or that teens neither have the resources nor the maturity to handle the responsibility of parenting. At any rate, there is citizen consensus that teens should not be pregnant or be parents. Now, teen pregnancy is the social problem. However, there are a number of, number of social conditions that contribute to the overall social problem of teen pregnancy. Through research, we've been able to identify a number of social conditions that make it more likely for teens to get pregnant. For example, lack of sex education, lack of parental guidance, or even media influences, and so on. In other words, social problems are rooted in some sort of social condition that makes a problem more likely to happen. In analyzing social problems, which is part of what we do in program evaluation, we must attend to the factors underlying the definition of the problem. It is these underlying factors that are being attended to that make up a program. For example, what are the things we do in a program to reduce or eliminate teen pregnancy? Well, we don't sterilize the girls or boys, and we don't force the girls to have abortions if they get pregnant. What we do in our programs is tackle the underlying factors. We provide that sex education. We have activities that get parents more involved, or the program then becomes a source of guidance in the absence of that parental invo involvement. 
So in program evaluation, we have to be aware of these underlying factors that contribute to the social problem so we know that the right types of activities are being administered in the program in order to determine if the program is effective. We wouldn't have program activities of exercise and diet control as part of a program to reduce teen pregnancy. That wouldn't make much sense in that type of program. It would make more sense in a weight loss kind of program. Okay, so let's take a minute now to practice defining social problems and identifying social conditions. Here's an example of, of uh, how to make the distinction between the two. So first, in my example, I'm thinking of teens driving drunk. So the first thing I want to do is simply state the nature of the problem in one or two sentences. Here my statement reads, the problem that needs to be addressed is the large number of teens in the county who drive drunk. Don't overthink this and make this statement as simple as you possibly can. Second, you'll want to specify the community location where the social problem exists and, and include both the governmental authority and the particular geographical location the problem exists. So here's my example. The location of the problem is in Tarrant County and involves state and local police. The third step is to list three undesirable social conditions that result from this problem. In my example, I have listed lost lives, injuries, and property damage. And then the fourth and final step then is to write a short sentence that summarizes the social problem in a specific geographical location, which also includes the adverse com consequences of the problem. The adverse consequences are what you would tackle in a program to reduce the social problem. Once you get the social problem clearly defined, as well as the undesirable social conditions that result from the problem, you can then clearly connect the social conditions to specific program activities. It is these program activities will th that will then help you reduce or allevi alleviate your social problem. So as you can see here, after going through the first four steps to clearly define my social problem, I continue with that definition on to the last step of making that connection between the social problem, the social condition, and the program activities. So here's my example. Remember, I ended up with the definition of my social problem as teenage drunk driving in Tarrant County leads to lost lives, injuries, and property damage. The next step was for me to think about the underlying condition that would cause this social problem. In my example, I believe the underlying conditions include the lack of education on the consequences of drunk driving, truly showing teens what happens with families who've lost loved ones because of the accident, and what happens to those who are injured. Also, another condition might be the lack of accountability in paying restitution for the damage they've caused to property. After you identify the underlying causes of a social problem, the next thing you'll do is identify activities that can lead to the elimination of the adverse consequences. So in my example, the consequences of lost lives, injuries, and property damage, uh, my program activities would be to increase the education about drunk driving and the consequences and to institute required community service for restitution of property damage. Hopefully you can see how my activities directly relate to what I believe to be the underlying conditions that lead to the, the social problems of teens driving drunk. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity in your discussion board this week to practice this, looking at social problems, social conditions, and creating program activities that connect directly to those conditions and that problem. So make sure on your discussion board you look out for the article that I give you to review in order to do this exercise with it.